this worship space, really because we've been doing all the things right as far as keeping each other safe. Um, I do encourage everyone to get vaccinated because the more that we can be vaccinated, then the more we can even open up further at GPC, and that is our hope and our, our goal. Um, if you're worshiping with us online, I invite you to find the bulletin on the resources tab that might be in a new place. It's because we have a new website, but go to the resources tab and there you can download the bulletin. And also you can sign the friendship pad there. And if you're visiting with us, then there's a visitor card and we ask you to fill that out if you are here with us visiting. We want to say a big thank you to Congregational Life Committee and also to John and to all of our wonderful musicians for the beautiful, wonderful, joyful, joy-filled worship service that was outside last Sunday. The weather was quite different than this. Um, it was a beautiful, warm, sunny spring day, wonderful to be outside. And we, we had different counts, somewhere between 90 and 100. I think is what the count was, and just a wonderful time to be outside. And um, so we're going to have Congregational Life um, is also working on the next outdoor music event. It won't be worship. It'll be different. It will be with the Ramblers, which is Chuck Utterback's. Um, he's with that group. And so just some cowboy western music, but it'll be fun. And it will be in the same space. So that is, save the date, mark your calendars for June the 5th. And we think it will be at 6 o'clock in the evening. That's a Saturday evening, so it won't interfere with worship at all. It's on Saturday evening, June the 5th. So mark your calendars for that. Um, vac vacation Bible School is coming up. First week in June, starting on June the 7th, going through the 11th. And you can participate in Vacation Bible School in multiple ways. Register your children and your grandchildren. You can volunteer, and you can also help with any of the supplies that are still needed. So you can read more about that in your bulletin. Um, a lot of our church family has been at Nakomi this weekend, and um, I've already heard from some that they had a wonderful weekend and even wonderful weather. So we're so grateful for that. Uh, we had a large number that were, going, that were attending, and we were really happy about that. Um, the last thing that I want to share is that following this morning's worship, um, we had another um, flood here at GPC, and it's all um, okay for now. Um, the only thing that I need you gentlemen to know is that you cannot use the urinal in the men's restroom, which was the culprit for the flood. Um, there is some damage downstairs, and we will deal with that tomorrow. But um, so for now, that's kind of all you need to know about the flood. So um, I invite you to read more about what's going on and the life uh, here in the, at GPC in your bulletin, in your leisure time. And then I invite us all to now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, you have gathered us into this space so that we might worship your holy name. And so as we enter into this time of worship, I pray that you would still all other voices but your own and help us to be attuned to what you would have us to hear as your word is read and proclaimed and sung. May it be so. We pray together through Christ, saying, Amen. If you'll please stand and sing with us. This first song we're going to sing is Crown Him, with many crowns, a version of it. And I'm pretty sure none of us have actually physically crowned somebody. Like, take it a crown. Well, I don't know what you guys do in your free time, but I have not <laughs> crowned somebody physically. And I, I wish I have because it's, it's such a cool representation. We do it. We don't physically do it, but we do it with our time and with our resources and uh, where we invest our energy in. We crown different things. And so as we sing this song, let's crown him.
Our scripture reading this evening comes from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Let us hear God's word to us. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go to the south, to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of Ethiopia, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and he asked him, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now, the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter And like a lamb, silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask, does a prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? 
He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In Marvel's Avengers Infinity Wars, Iron Man and Thor and Black Widow and all the other Avengers unite to battle together their most powerful villain ever, the evil Thanos. But in order to understand the depth and importance of their mission, we need to know the backstory of the infinity stones that the Avengers strive to protect. Now, if everything I just said sounds quite a bit foreign to you, as it really does to me, most of us have teenagers in our lives that we can rely on to help us to understand this backstory, or otherwise we're not going to know that the fate of the planet rests on the success of these superheroes. Or maybe there's another story that I might share that might be more familiar with most of us. If you haven't seen the first few episodes of Downton Abbey, then you're not going to understand why Lord Grantham is desperately seeking a new male heir. You're not going to understand the rivalry, rivalry between the Grantham sisters. You can't know what you don't know is a very true and profound statement. The point is that origin or backstories are important to our understanding more than just fiction. And today's narrative from the Acts of the Apostles is a good example of our need to know and understand what has come before in order to know and understand what's going on in Luke's narrative writing. Knowing the backstory is also known as meeting someone right where they are and then listening to learn how they got there. So let's meet our three characters in this narrative. There's Philip, the evangelist. There's an Ethiopian eunuch. And there's the Holy Spirit of God who is both the director and a participant in the story. The action of the narrative proceeds in a chiastic literary pattern with the right question placed at the intersection of of, and framed by this inverted parallelism. Here's how the action unfolds. The Holy Spirit both directs as director and then tells as participant, Philip, what to do and where to go. Philip gets up, does, goes, just as the Holy Spirit directs and tells him. The Ethiopian eunuch has just come from Jerusalem where he sought God through worship and now he is found reading from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah as he travels back to Ethiopia. Then Philip shows up, conversation ensues, all directed by the Holy Spirit, and then the right question gets inserted into the action. And from that point on, The literary pattern reverses the fate of both the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip the evangelist. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? We know what's going on with these two characters right before the narrative when we know what's happening in the story. But what is missing is the backstories. What brought them to this place in this moment in their lives and what it means for both the hearers back in the first century and the hearers in the 21st century. Truth be told, it is usually the case of a remarkable story. It is the backstory that makes a story unforgettable and remarkable. And this story is no different. It is 
It is so true that in just a few minutes, we're going to get goosebumps. As we begin to understand the story's significance in all lives concerned, including our own. So here we go. First, let's remember that the book of Acts is a theological historical narrative written by Luke in the mid to late first century. The book of Acts interprets the significance of God's work through Jesus Christ and his followers through the power of the Holy Spirit as it tracks the church's growth following Jesus' resurrection and ascension. Now, who is Philip? Philip is one of the seven men initially chosen to care for the needy widows in the early church. Philip went to Samaria, not because he wanted to, but because he, like the other apostles, is subject to God's asserting love. It's the Holy Spirit who sent them out to preach the good news of the gospel to Samaria and beyond. The Holy Spirit is turning the world upside down and the Holy Spirit's vessels to make it happen are the followers of Jesus Christ. Now, what did it mean to be an Ethiopian eunuch in the first century? Well, as you might guess, it's twofold. First, the Greek word translated as Ethiopia refers to all the people in the land south of Egypt in Africa. The word literally means burnt face or blackness. This is the first time that a person is identified as black in the New Testament. He is as different in appearance to Philip as Philip is to him. One is African and one is Middle Eastern. The circumstances of the Ethiopian eunuch's travels tell us even more about him. He travels by chariot indicating his prominence and status in the queen's court. He is reading from the scroll of Isaiah. This tells us about his wealth. For the scrolls of the Hebrew scriptures were individually penned by scribes, and they were quite expensive. And he's reading while traveling. He is leisurely riding in his chariot and reading from the scroll of Isaiah while his chariot is being driven by a chariot driver. So the Ethiopian eunuch is not lacking in wealth or status. But we're soon to learn that he is seriously lacking spiritually and he is seriously seeking God. As we might imagine, it's not his status or his wealth that excludes him from worshiping God in the assembly of the court of the Lord. And even though the Ethiopian eunuch's skin color is different, his racial, ethnic, or national background would most likely not have prevented him from entering into the inner court of the Lord. So what is it? It's the physical nature of his body that causes him to be considered other in the eyes of the religious leaders, for he is also a eunuch. This means that he has been castrated probably before puberty in order that he can be trusted to serve in the royal court as a man who wouldn't prey on the young women who were either of the king's harem or who were ladies in waiting to the queen. Even though this is something done to them, eunuchs were stereotyped as sexually immoral and thus they were forbidden from entering into the inner court. Of the Lord. Why would this aspect of his personhood keep him from worshiping God with everyone else? Clearly, he is a God seeker with a strong affinity for Judaism. He has traveled a long distance to worship in Jerusalem at the temple. Because he's a reader of Scripture, he may have gone knowing that he would be turned away and not allowed into the inner spaces to worship with the other males. Or he may have gone hoping that his status or his wealth would allow him to enter in and worship God. 
He has monetary means and status. So why would his physical body, his gender identity or sexuality prevent him from worshiping God? We need to know a little bit more of his backstory. During the Mosaic period, around the 7th century before the birth of Jesus, 613 prohibitions and mandates were set in place to govern the lives of the ancient Israelites to set them apart from the rest of the known world. These prohibitions included governance about who could and not, could not enter into the assembly of the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. One of these prohibitions is recorded in Deuteronomy 23.2. It says, No one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of the Lord. New Testament scholar Karen Baker Fletcher writes, Its purpose was to give lower social religious status to eunuchs because they were seen as scarred, defective men, unable to. To be fruitful and multiply. Let's pause just a moment and allow that to sink in about this these people being excluded from the worship of God. Next, we must wonder was the exclusion binding for all time? Thankfully, the answer is a resounding no. For God, through the prophet Isaiah, addresses these exclusions, revealing God's continual reconciliation of the world and humanity back to God's self. In Isaiah 56, written in the mid to late 6th century before the birth of Jesus, we hear God's voice saying through the prophet, Don't let the immigrant who is joined with the Lord say, the Lord will exclude me from the people. And don't let the eunuch say, I'm just a dry tree. The Lord says, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, choose what I desire and remain loyal to my covenant in my temple and my courts. I will give them a monument and I will name them better than sons and daughters. I will give them an enduring name that won't be removed. My house will be known as a house of prayer for all people, says the Lord God, who gathers Israel's outcasts. I will gather still others to those that I have already gathered. Clearly, God promises to gather the outcasts, those on the outside looking in. So to recap, first came the prohibition, And then came the prophecy of a messianic blessing. The book of Isaiah is a book full of hope and promise for all of those who have previously been seen as outcasts. Those who have previously been othered by society and culture and most importantly by the religious leaders of the temple of Jerusalem. These people were poor or sick or lame, or disabled, or homeless, or hungry, or widows, or women in general. They were eunuchs, or captives, or otherwise marginalized people. This messianic blessing envisions the time yet to come when all of those on the outside looking in, all of those who seek to find and worship and serve and love God are finally free to fully participate in all aspects of God's family. What comes next is the fulfillment of the prophecy which we are blessed to know through this evening's reading. It's the liberating message of the gospel for all people. No matter our social status, our ethnicity, our race, our sexual orientation, our gender identity, or any other aspect of our personhood, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch learning that he too is to be included in God's family just as he is, nothing about him needs to change, is for him and us and for everyone everywhere liberating. For no one is ever to be kept outside looking in and uninvited into the fellowship of God's household. Once he was excluded, now he is included. Once he was scorned and now he is a baptized child 
of God. My sisters and brothers, in this man's life, there were gatekeepers preventing him from acceptance and therefore from the worship of God. In our world, too, there are gatekeepers who consider people different from them as other and in so doing prevent them from coming inside and enjoying a life fully accepted as children of God and members of God's household just as they are. We've seen it in our own lifetime. We've seen it recently. We've been witnesses of people held at bay from the full inclusion in the family of God. The right question that is asked at the very center of this literary narrative is the one the Ethiopian eunuch asks immediately after hearing the gospel message of Jesus' inclusive saving grace. Is there anything to prevent me from being baptized? Granted, there could have been many barriers. He lived in Ethiopia, far from Jerusalem. He was a eunuch and thus in violation of the ancient purity code. He was loyal to the wrong sovereign in the wrong nation. And more importantly, he possessed the wrong sexuality. But Philip didn't rely on what might have been his own prejudices to inform his answer. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was leading and guiding him. God was chasing after this particular man because of all the people on earth that he represented. He resides on the outer boundary of the possibility of Jewish existence. And there at that border, God will bring the difference near, very near to the hearth of home and the spirit. And it's that very spirit that gave Philip the very right answer to his question. And so as the Holy Spirit of God spoke through the now prophet Philip, he answered, no, absolutely nothing. And both of their lives were changed forever. Do you feel the goosebumps now? We never know what the Holy Spirit intends to do in and through us. We cannot even know if we will see the fruit of the Spirit's work in our own lifetime. But we know that the Holy Spirit speaks through us so that others will know that they too are welcome and included in the household of God. Lest we forget, Scripture reminds us, here these these passages. Now go. And I will help you as you speak, and I will teach you what to say. For at that time, the Holy Spirit will teach you what you should say. Do not worry about what you will say, but say whatever is given you by the Holy Spirit in that moment. Philip had not planned to venture out into that wilderness road along the Mediterranean coast from Jerusalem towards Gaza and surely had not planned to encounter a pond along the desert road. But the Spirit called, and Philip went just as the Spirit commanded him, teaching that the prophecies in Isaiah had been revealed and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He shares the gospel message, and then a pond of water appears, and the rest, as they say, is a beautiful history. As this man, who strongly identified with the humiliated suffering servant that he just read about in the scroll of Isaiah. This man who represents so many who've been left out, the outcast on the outside looking in simply because they're different in some, in some way from what is deemed normal to society and culture and even the church. This man who'd been turned away from worshiping God his whole life long was baptized and welcomed in to the family of God. Honestly, he's like us. Once we were excluded and now we are included. That's a paraphrase of 1 Peter 2.10, which says, Once you were not a people, now you are a people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. 
but mostly he's like all of those the gatekeepers keep out, even though we know better. Lest we forget, listen to these scripture passages that remind us that all people are beloved children of God, made in God's holy image exactly as they are and are invited into God's family. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. The mystery is that Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made, is mine. Whoever does the will of the Father in in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Sisters and brothers, as we prepare ourselves to come to the table of our Lord and Savior, let each one of us prayerfully consider whether we've been serving as gatekeepers, not for God, but for who knows why. Maybe consciously or unconsciously, we've kept people from the love of God, the love of God's family. And if this is us, let us seek God's forgiveness and a new pathway forward towards reconciliation with those that we've considered other May we seek to be reconciled with God. And if you are someone who's felt left out, know now that you are invited to come first. You know, meeting people right where they are, listening and understanding their backstories is vital to becoming empathetic and caring of all people no matter, and most especially, if at first glance they seem different to us in some way. We, like Isaiah and Jesus and Philip and the eunuch, are affirmed in the call to share the good news of the God of Israel revealed in Jesus without partiality or prejudice. First, there was a prohibition Then there was a prophecy of a new way. And then there was the fulfillment of the prophecy right before our eyes as the words on the page blossomed into full technicolor for us to see and know God's great, big, inclusive love. The Ethiopian eunuch asked, Is there anything to prevent me? from being baptized? The right answer is always absolutely nothing. May we be those who invite everyone into God's household, those who share God's inclusive love with everyone we meet in every community of faith, including our own, and on every road we travel just like Philip. May it be so. May it be so. And to God be all glory, honor, and praise. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, may the words that we have heard tonight seep into our very souls and transform us until we become the people that you call us to be. Through Christ we pray, and together we say, Amen. I want at this moment to change hats. And I want to share with you 
what we call a moment for mission. Because May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So I want to take this opportunity to share with this gathered assembly of God here to worship God just a little bit about the importance of recognizing our own mental health and caring for those around us. Because we all know that during this pandemic, it's been really hard. And so in order to understand mental health, let me just explain a little bit about mental illness. Depression is overwhelming sadness that doesn't go away. Anxiety is when worries and fears affect our ability to function day to day. Compulsive behaviors, when our anxieties manifest in behaviors that we feel as though we must repeat over and over again. Bipolar, when mood swings, very high high and very low lows are pervasive and persistent. Psychosis, when we feel as though our brain is playing tricks on us, seeing and hearing and believing things that aren't quite right. Eating disorders, when our physical health and overall well-being are affected by what we eat or don't eat. Post-traumatic stress, when we are continually bothered by a previous traumatic life event. Addiction, when alcohol or controlled substance takes over our lives. These are brain disorders. And in the midst of crisis, certainly, uh, these orders can become even harder than we've ever experienced. So how can we help ourselves and one another? We can normalize the struggles of mental illness through educating ourselves, through being empathetic with ourselves and with one another. We can ask for help and we can offer help. Here at GPC, we are connected to many different organizations that do offer help for various mental illnesses. NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental, Mental Illness, and they support families, and they offer group classes. During the pandemic, they're meeting virtually. They meet on the first and third Tuesdays of each month. If you want to know more about NAMI meetings, you can let me know. Samaritan Counseling has an office here at GPC, and they offer counseling services for individuals and families and couples. We also have a wonderful grief support group. We have a wonderful certified grief counselor in Stephanie Wall. If you'd like to know more about the grief support group, I'm happy to share that information. And we have a circles of care ministry that has blossomed in the midst of the pandemic. And that has about 30 people caring for about 150 of our most elderly uh, members here at GPC, those who would be the most vulnerable, we think, for feeling isolated and alone. If you know someone that we would need to reach out to, please let me know. Or if you'd like to be a, a, a part of this important ministry, I'd be happy for you to participate. Also, other things that you can do is to stay connected to your own family, to reach out and ask them to check on you as well. You can also stay connected through worship in person or online. You can listen to our daily devotions that we post on our Facebook page every morning at 10. Of course, we have Sunday school classes, Bible studies, fellowship groups, other ways that you can help yourself and you can share with others. You can also serve God by serving others. You can unplug your phone for at least 60 minutes every day. You can go outside and get fresh air. I know you know all of these things, but it's important that we be reminded for our own mental health and to be able to help others with their mental health as well. Okay, I'm going to shift hats one more time as we move into our offering time and then our, uh, our time at the table. So if you're worshiping with us online, you can find um, opportunities to give to uh, the work of God's church here at GPC on the giving tab. So look for that uh, on the website. And if you're worshiping with us in person, you'll find the offering trays as you exit. And they're right there. Can't miss them. And so let us give generously to the work of God's church. Let us give with great joy. Thank you.
Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with you and you with me. We believe that at the Lord's Supper, the community of believers is renewed by the memory of Christ's life, death, and resurrection, by his real presence in the power of the Holy Spirit, and by the promise of his coming again. Christ makes himself known to us in the breaking of bread. Christ offers us his body broken for our sake and his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. We accept his promises and gifts and depend on his life to sustain us. In turn, we offer ourselves in thanksgiving to the risen Lord who has conquered death. So I invite you to gather your elements, bread and wine or juice or crackers and grapes for this sacrament of Holy Communion. If these elements aren't available to you this evening, I invite you to just simply listen and receive the blessings that are offered to you in this moment. Let us come together as one body of Christ and let us pray. Oh God, today you have called us together to be the church. Unite us now at your table. Make us one in Christ Jesus. Let your spirit empower the life we share and ignite our witness in the world. With all who have gone before us, keep us faithful to the gospel teachings and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Merciful God, we praise you that you give strength for every weakness, forgiveness for our failures, and new beginnings in Christ. God of compassion, we pray for the church in the world, especially this family of faith. We, we ask your blessings on our fellowship and mission, particularly those enjoying time at Nakomi. Return them safely home today. We hold up before you the victims of tragedy and disaster, especially those around the world impacted by senseless violence, and trauma. We continue to pray for those suffering from the pandemic, the surging spread of the disease in India, Brazil, parts of our own country, and throughout the world as we reach a global peak. We pray for those who weep with grief, and we pray for continued strength for all caretakers. We pray for reconciliation in the world. Help us to continue to pursue justice and righteousness where there is conflict. We pray for those who are poor or vulnerable. We pray for the outcast, the abused, the neglected, imprisoned or alone, sick or suffering. We pray for the renewal of those who despair. Bring your comfort and peace. For all these, Lord, we ask your blessings of wisdom and strength, of perseverance and resilience, of healing and hope to be with each one. May they and may we know your presence. Through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church now and forever. And let us join our voices together as we say the words that Jesus taught the disciples to say, Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins 
as we forgive those who sin against us, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he shared a meal with his disciples. And during the meal, Jesus took the bread. He gave thanks to God for the bread, and he broke it open, saying, This is my body given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup, saying, This is is the cup of the new covenant shed by my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Drink this in remembrance of me. For every time that we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim our Lord and Savior saving death until he comes again. These are the gifts of God, and they are for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us partake of Holy Communion together. Body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We give thanks that you have invited us to this table. We give thanks that you have received us as members of the body of Christ and have affirmed us as a community of faith. Lead us to live as faithful and dedicated disciples in service to all the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
made a way for all to enter in. Friends, know that wherever you are, God has sent you there. God has led you there. And the Holy Spirit of God intends to do something in and through you. And you don't have to worry because the Holy Spirit's going to make you brave. And the Holy Spirit is going to provide the words that you need in that moment. So now as you go forth into the world to share the love of Jesus with everyone you meet, may the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit of God abide with each and every one of you, binding you to one another and to Almighty God now and forevermore. And let God's people say, Amen.